So hi to anyone who's just joined. We're just going to wait a few minutes just as attendees start coming in and then we'll kick off. Hi there, anyone who's just joined. Uh, we're just going to wait for more people to come in to start the webinar. Um, but welcome everyone to Measuring Your Impact with Business Sports. Hi everyone, um, if you're just joining us, um, welcome to today's webinar on measuring your impact. Um, we still have people joining, so it's just uh, one, minute, one minute past one. So we're just gonna wait maybe another minute before we kick off um, just to let more people come in um, and then we'll commence. So I think we're going to get started. Um, so hello and welcome to today's webinar, uh, Measuring Your Impact with Business to Arts. Um, we're currently recording this webinar and we'll be posting it on our YouTube channel after it's complete. complete. So if you need to hop off early, um, you'll be able to catch it there and you'll have an email in your inbox um, if you registered on Eventbrite. Um, so in terms of just some quick, quick housekeeping, um, so this is a webinar format, um, attendees will, will not be shown, um, just the presenters. Um, our presenters today, we're all here from Business to Arts. So I'm Michelle Reed, Senior Manager of Arts Programme. We also have Eileen Hanratty, Senior Manager for Membership and Projects. And we also have Emily Carson, our Head of Communications and Partnerships. Um, you can use the Q&A uh, box to submit your questions throughout the webinar. And we've set aside some Q&A um, time at the end of the webinar. So in terms of today's agenda, we're going to cover the following points. Um, a little, we're going to go through just a little bit about Business to Arts and Arts Affiliate Programme. And then we'll move on to what we mean by evaluation and what we mean by impact. And then we'll look at some types of evaluation. So we'll be looking specifically um, in the context of our own experience of business to arts with corporate sponsorship, grants and commissioning. And then we'll turn our attention to looking at um, how you could leverage evaluation for future proposals or applications. And then we'll look at some top tips and then some Q&A. So in terms of business to arts, um, I know we have some people joining us who aren't as familiar, so I'm just going to quickly go through just a little bit about our affiliate program so you can um, have some idea. Um, so we're a member, we're a nonprofit membership based organization. We have over 300 members, including approximately 150 arts affiliate members who engage with us through our affiliate program. So annually, we dedicate around 2,000 man hours to meeting and advising people um, in the arts and culture sector um, and managing our um, giving them advice around um, sponsorship and different types of things like that. And in terms of the overall benefits that you can avail of, you might be interested in some of the following. So in terms of general representation and advocacy, our affiliates, they're part of a network. It's visible to businesses who are looking to engage in the arts. 
And then also the knowledge that um, we gain from our affiliates around their needs and activities, we can advise our business members on their own arts engagement. We also advocate for corporate support at government level. So in last year, we um, during the pandemic, we submitted a white paper um, to the special committee of COVID-19. And the paper was called Rebooting the Economy, the impact of funding from business partnerships. So you can find this on our publications page along with other research and publications. You can also avail of training um, and professional skills. So we have a long-standing partnership with the Irish Times Training. Um, you can um, avail of courses there with a seven, up to a 70% discount on some, of those, um, on some of those courses. And then as well as training with that partnership with Irish Times, you can also access fundraising and sponsorship skills sessions with our team. So these are usually two hour group meetings with our affiliates and they offer the opportunity for our affiliates to discuss their sponsorship needs, identify their offering and then understand how to prospect for potential sponsors. And as a follow up, we then review sponsorship documents that the affiliates prepare and offer individual feedback and advice. And then another key way that we engage with our affiliates um, is through our mentorship meetings. So you can avail up to three one to one meetings every year and then other benefits that you might be interested in availing of our network opportunities like our membership events and our awards, access to paywall research and publications, and then also discounts on job advertising and recruitment services via create, uh, Creative Careers and Charity Careers Ireland, which is a specialist group uh, recruiters in Irish charities and also creative sectors. And then there might be other bespoke training that you're interested in. And if there's something else that you think we can support you in, we're always happy to have a chat and, um, and hear what, what your needs are. So in terms of evaluation and impact, what do we mean by that? And welcome to anyone who's just joined us. Um, so to begin with, what do we mean by evaluation? Well, if we just take a look at a basic um, definition from the dictionary, it's the process of judging and calculating the quality, importance, amount, or value of something. In Business to Arts, we um, look to the four impact model and they have a broader definition, which um, gives us kind of a deeper understanding of valuation. So here you can see it's evaluation tells you where you stand. It's an assessment, a ranking or a rating. Evaluations are always in some respect comparisons, whether that's implicitly or explicitly against others or against a particular set of standards. And evaluations align expectations, clarify consequences and inform decision making. So to give you an example, if you have a project that was to give musical instruments to elderly people, you, at the end of that process and the end of that project, you might be comparing the skills of those elderly people. Let's say if they played the trumpet, they might have not played the trumpet ever. And then at the end, you're, there's a comparison going on there um, and you're looking at a particular set of standards or um, a situation. And we've seen an increase um, in evaluation briefs over the last number of years, but as most of you probably experienced, it's, it's very hard to kind of have the resources or funds to do any kind of full scale third party evaluation. So hopefully today you're going to leave with some takeaways on methods of evaluation that you can implement yourself. And I understand some of you probably do this all the time. Other people, it's, it's newer to you. So um, some of might be this content might be familiar to you and then some of it might be um, less. And then in terms of impact, well, what do we mean by that? So again, looking at a very simple uh, definition, a powerful effect that something, especially something new, has on a situation or a person. And if we broaden this out, kind of in the context of what we're talking about here today, impact is the demonstrable contribution that a project, program or organisation makes to its audiences, users, community or society. So what do we mean by all of this? Well, through evaluation, you're able to get quantitative and qualitative inputs and feedback for your programmes and your activities. And you do this by gathering data stories and through this you can start measuring that genuine impact of the work so this can help improve the work it can help you to report back to your peers your funders and audience as well as help to generate stories or data that you might be able to use potentially for your marketing or communications and this type of communications is called your case for support so before we jump into um, kind of more around the main contact of today's uh, webinar, it's really important for us to just take that kind of, state, kind of step back and look at the broader picture of valuation. So debates around social impact of the arts and the development of methodologies for the measurement of valuation. It's really played a prominent role in cultural policy discourse and research probably over the last 20 years. And evaluation, it can sometimes be looked at as box ticking exercise. Um, a lot of the time we see funders and policymakers, they require practical outcomes and robust evaluation as part of their engagement with a particular um, program or project. 
But there's also that argument for the, the argument of art for art's sake, you know, that arts shouldn't have to attach themselves to any kind of socioeconomic impact. And, and if they do have an impact, why, why should or why does that have to be evaluated? And look, there's many nuances to this debate and the scale and the scope of evaluation is going to differ from artist to artist um, and arts organisations based on your own capacity, capacity and your resources, um, as well as the type of project that you're actually working on. So today we're going to focus on our own learnings and tips of evaluation from our experience of business to arts around the areas of corporate sponsorship, grants, commissioning. Um, we've seen that even the simplest of methods of evaluation can really have a major impact and bring opportunities for artists and arts organizations to really communicate their that impact and this case for support, which I mentioned before. And we've also seen arts organizations um, use impact statements kind of, let's say, on an annual basis to build a really strong and persuasive case for supports. So in terms of overview of the types of evaluation, um, some of this might be quite quite basic for some of you, but we'll go through it. It's, it's all relevant. Um, in terms of quantitative um, information, which is numerical, it compares data that can be counted or somehow expressed in numbers. So it responds well to questions like how many, how much, how long, how often. So if we're going to look, let's say, an example, an example of this, um, if we were to take a project that's going to see a group of artists work with a local community to create um, some artworks in a public space. Um, and the evaluation process um, could be closed ended questions. You could ask attendees um, how long they've spent looking at the artworks. Um, in terms of data, you could um, measure how many attendees visited each day. This is perhaps maybe a, a volunteer simply counting heads or perhaps if it's a kind of a closed, there's a closed access point, you might have scanners. And then if you're using social media, you could um, use the reports from social media stats to kind of measure engagement levels. And really the thing about quantitative or quantitative um, evaluation is it's usually for a larger sample size. So you might do something to kind of, to, to get a broad, broad understanding. You could send out a survey to a large group of um, visitors for to the, um, the project. And then if we look at qualitative, this is usually a qualitative information that's textual or expressed in other forms, such as images or sound. Qualitative data usually responds well to questions such as how or why, and usually it's in a small sample size. So again, if we take this example of this project, um, where artists are working with a community to create um, artworks in a public space, open-ended questions that you could ask visitors. How do you think the artworks have affected the local area? Um, or you could ask um, the community participants who were working with the artists, how do you feel about the artworks you've created? Or how, how did you feel going through the process with the artists? Then in terms of descriptions, um, the, uh, the artists, they could describe how they developed their practice through this process of working with the community. And then documenting the process, Again, this could be something where there are videos or interviews with the artists or with the community group. Um, there could also be a case study that could be written um, at the end with those different variables, so different, different types of evaluation. Um, and then testimonials and feedback, usually for a smaller sample size. And I think with this example that I'm giving, which is a kind of largely it's kind of visual based project for a lot of visual based projects, evaluation might not be able to manifest in a verbal or a written form. And um, so a videographer might be able to document a project to provide kind of a visual record of a project um, and its impact. So that might be another way that you could look at it. Um, I'm going to hand over to Emily now, who's going to talk to us about evaluating corporate sponsorships. Great, thanks, Michelle. Um, if you wouldn't mind just clicking onto the um to the next slide there. So um just once again, we're gonna start with a little bit of an overview and a definition about what sponsorship actually is. Um so if you wanna uh, just click there, Michelle. So in business arts, if we're doing kind of like an introduction to sponsorship session, the way we'll typically describe sponsorship is the financial or material support of an event, person, organization, group, or product by private individuals or organizations. It is given with the expectation of a benefit in return. An organization can communicate with its target audiences through sponsorship. And then we also look to one of our sister organizations, um, Arts and Business, who in their sponsorship manual describe it as a payment of money by a business to an arts organization with the explicit objective of promoting the business's name, its products, services, or image. Sponsorship is part of a business's general promotional spending and may encompass staff development as well as a sense of corporate social responsibility. So when we look at that, I think it's just important to kind of reframe and, and remind ourselves of what the kind of value exchange is that's going on when you decide to engage with a corporate sponsorship. And also, I think that piece around that general promotional spending, like we have to remember that you know, um, a business is looking at its overall marketing and promotional spending for the year. And when they decide to engage with you to, you know, promote um, 
uh, sponsor and promote your you know, exhibition or your event or your festival, they're effectively ring fencing budget that they would have spent maybe on an advertising campaign. And so the next year or the next time they're doing a spending review, they're going to be asked, well, did that deliver on certain aims or um, objectives that we have? in order to make it make sense for us if we're going to ring fence that budget again to progress with the relationship or to renew it or even expand it. Um, so I think that's just really important to have in your head when you're beginning even to think about approaching businesses and this is the value exchange that's going on and it needs to make sense for the business as much as it makes sense to the arts organisation. So why do businesses sponsor the arts? Um, there's a number of different reasons. The first uh, might be to differentiate themselves from competitors. So um, you can have businesses in certain industries where um, it's very typical for in that industry for different businesses to sponsor sports, or maybe they have like more of a charity focus. And then sponsoring an arts organization can mean that they have the opportunity to reach an entirely different audience, speak to them in a completely different way to the way that their competitors are speaking. Um, it could be to grow their business, kind of an obvious one, but you know they reach a new audience through your event or your exhibition or your project. And um, that audience hopefully becomes some of their customers. They turn into sales leads and in turn grows their revenue. To improve staff engagement and interaction. And this is kind of an interesting one because this is one that has become more prominent and more important the last couple of years because of the way that people are now working from home. Some of the typical ways to engage with staff have changed. Um, and a good example of this is a couple of years ago in our Business Arts Awards, one of the key winners was um, Grant Thornton's sponsorship of the Female Conductor Programme, the National Concert Hall. And um, what Grant Thornton offered, not only was it, you know, the kind of um, benefit of the cash sponsorship, but they also did um, a series of uh, workshops with their staff. So their staff provided professional development and kind of practical business skill workshops to these female conductors. Female conductors are often um, like sole traders, they work as freelancers, so they need kind of a broader width of business skills to be able to be successful and that meant that from Grant Thornton's perspective you know their staff were able to actually get involved very very um, intrinsically in the program and in delivering it it meant that they could talk about that to potential people that might work with them that this is a benefit that you get to be involved in the sponsorship and it showed that there was um yeah just kind of like a bigger engagement with the project over and above just giving money um, to engage customers in new in, and innovative ways. Um, another national concert hall sponsorship that's very good for this actually is um, Davy Stockbrokers, who were winners this year. So Davy joined the National Concert Hall as innovation partners in early 2020, and then the pandemic happened. So they actually really did have to come like big innovation partners. So all of a sudden the National Concert Hall had to move all of its projects and, and, um, and exhibitions, and not exhibitions, it's, it's uh, concerts online. So Davy knew that their customers, a large part of their customers are very interested in classical music and in music in general. And all of a sudden they got to help deliver this innovative online program that meant that they were reaching their customers in entirely new ways um, that, that, to help them engage with those customers again to establish or develop a new brand. So this is one that you'll quite often see, um, particularly at kind of festivals and events. Um, a new brand is typically with consumer brands as well. So like you might see that a new beer comes out and then they sponsor um, an exhibition or they sponsor a bar that's at um, a particular like festival or theater event. Um, and it can be a way for people to experience a new brand in a really nice setting that they feel comfortable and happy in. And then they have a positive association with that new brand as it's coming to market to raise their media profile. And this is definitely one that we think about in Business Starts as well. And um, when we're engaging with projects, we look at, you know, when we work on a project and we release it to media, are we getting the opportunity to do interviews? Um, do we get quotes uh, into, the, into the media based on the project? Are we landing photo calls? Um, and these are all things that if a business is trying to reach a new audience or be talking in a different way that they're gonna be looking at. To connect their business to the local community and economy and um, this is one that's pretty good actually for kind of smaller scale sponsorships and uh, one of our award winners this year drew a theatre with Aerogen. So Aerogen are um, a phar pharmaceutical company based out in Galway and um, they wanted to deepen their connection with the local community and they were also very interested in education. And Druid Theatre had um, the Druid Gregory program, which was looking at bringing theatre performances and workshops to local schools. So by Erigen sponsoring that, it meant that they got to have that connection with both their kind of own values about promoting education, but also with reaching more people in the local um, community in Galway. To create innovative sampling or conversion opportunities. This one actually in the before times was very big in music festivals. So it might be something like energy drinks would have loved to, you know, offer you a sample at a music festival. You're once again in a like happy environment. It means that you have a positive association with the brand and you might be more inclined to, to pick something up again. Um, conversion opportunities, another big one at music festivals was uh, 
people like Just Eat or Deliveroo um, offering discount codes at the end of a festival. So, uh, you, you know, you're exhausted coming back from a festival, you don't want to cook, you're immediately getting converted into a customer of Just Eat or Deliveroo on the back of having been at that um, at that event. So it can be an interesting way of thinking kind of laterally of how can a business get involved with an arts event and, and generate some, some customers. And then I have one more. Or maybe I don't. OK, so the one the other one that is missing here is um, to deliver on a brand's purpose. So it's here. Great. Um, so uh, this is something that's become kind of more important in the last few years. A lot of businesses and brands have started to look at what their core purpose is and kind of really making their strategic um, their strategic plan based on this. A good example of this is on post and the on post Irish Book Awards. So on post refreshed its whole brand strategy in 2019 and their brand purpose is to um, act for the common good um, and to improve the quality of life for now and for generations to come. So for them, reading and improving literacy and reading and the well-being associated with reading and the educational benefits associated with reading are all very connected to that. And so for them, when they were approached by the Irish Book Awards, it made complete sense that they would help to deliver on that brand promise by engaging in a sponsorship like that. Um, so definitely like that's something to be very aware of if you're looking at, at researching um, a potential sponsorship relationship to be looking at what the brand's purpose is and, and making sure that's very front of mind in any discussions that you're having. So how do you measure the success of your sponsorship relationship? So um, we do a survey every year as part of our Business Starts Awards application process. And uh, this has shown us then what, what are the kind of key measures of success and um, the evaluation processes that the business sponsor is looking for and, and that they're engaging in themselves. So as you can see at the top of this graph, it's media monitoring and online campaign measurement kind of neck and neck there. Um, and those actually, so online campaign measurement has, has increased a lot in terms of what sponsors are looking for for a measure of success um, in comparison to previous years as things have moved even more and more online. So if you think back to what are the reasons for businesses sponsoring, so if it's to raise a media profile, obviously media monitoring would be a key measure of success and an evaluation technique to figure out whether or not that's been borne out by the sponsorship. Um, if you're looking to engage with customers in an engaging new novel way, then things like online campaign measurement and getting a sense of customer engagement through comments or, or through polls can be a way of um, understanding that. And then staff engagement numbers. So as I mentioned, uh, staff engagement, it can look a few different ways. It can be something to do with, you know, how they're engaging in, in maybe delivering on a workshop, or it can be how many of our staff actually attended the event or viewed the event. And if that's the kind of metric that they're looking for, some of the ways that you as the kind of arts uh, partner can look at evaluating that as maybe you know you're conducting a survey afterwards to find out where people worked and what their sentiment was towards the event maybe you're offering a specific discount code to um, a certain business so that you know how many people have used it and therefore you know how many of the staff were engaged and actually attended so I think it's just trying to connect what the what the aim is that you've agreed with what type of evaluation or um, measuring technique you're going to use um, so that you can understand how to connect all of them together. So in terms then of evaluating a corporate sponsorship, um, there's kind of a few kind of key things that is, are definitely worth focusing on. Um, so agreeing the project aim in advance is definitely number one. Um, obviously, once you're beginning to research into a corporate sponsor, you're typically looking at the things that are important to them and you're sort of thinking, well, where are the synergies between what we do and what they're looking to do so that it could be a beneficial relationship for you both. But what's so important is to actually crystallize the exact of that and the exact aim that you're trying to reach with this project in advance, because you don't want to get halfway through and then realize that they're expecting one outcome and you're expecting another. So for example, um, oh, sorry, I'll, I'm not finished there for a second, John. Um, so for example, you might be thinking about um, uh, they want to increase uh, the number of 18 to 25 year olds that engage with them or that buy their product and you are delivering a theater project specifically for 18 to 25 year olds um, and uh, yeah so that, that could be maybe your shared aim or it may be that uh, you know their brand purpose is very connected to the fact that you're developing artistic skills in an under-resourced community and, and that's the kind of shared project aim that you have. Um, so if we just go on then, uh, the, so the next thing that you'll need to do in order to deliver on that project aim is to agree SMART project objectives. Some of you might have heard of like that acronym SMART before. It's something that's used a lot in like project management. So it's something that um, a lot of businesses will be very kind of au fait with. Um, the objectives are basically the steps along the way that you're going to need to hit in order to, to reach that aim. So say you're trying to hit that 18 to 25 year old group. Are you maybe going to be brokering a media partnership that uh, is with like a magazine that's specifically targeted to 18 to 25 year olds? Um, if you're trying to provide artistic skills to an under resource group, are you running workshops in, in that community in order for those people to learn that skill set? Um, 
And then, so SMART is specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. And if you want to ensure that your objectives are SMART, um, you can keep it specific by asking the like who, what, where, how, and why for each objective. Um, you can make it measurable by thinking about, okay, well, how am I actually going to gather the information to be able to report that back? So am I going to do an audience survey? Am I going to do a focus group? Am I going to do a social media poll? Um, just think about the different ways in which you can actually measure that. Um, keep it achievable by also using your own industry knowledge. So what do you know is realistic in the context of you having run previous events or previous types of projects like this? Um, and then also make sure that you've actually budgeted time to do the evaluation work and make sure that's reflected in the type of fee that you're asking for. Like this is man hour time to do this. This is lots of thinking time and lots of prep time. Make sure that you've thought about what that looks like in terms of the days you'll have to allocate to that. Um, ensure that your objectives are relevant by sense checking it against the project aim. And then also thinking about the values of your own practice and the values of your business partner and why you've gone into this kind of relationship in the first place. And are these objectives true to those? And then, um, so finally, the time bound one, I mean, looking at a lot of sponsorship relationships, it's very clear that you have to deliver something by a certain date and that you need to have a certain amount of information for that point. Um, but just make sure that you're thinking about the objectives. And if you need to get a certain amount of information from one of them, if you don't get that on time, is that going to have a knock on effect for another one? Um, like it could be something around a post event survey, like, you know, time bound wise, it needs to be completed and returned to you within kind of like three to five days after the event for it to be most effective. So things like that can be really important. Um, agreeing the key indicators that will change. So key indicators or kind of measures of success are connected to each one of your project objectives. Um, and it shows you that you're going in the right direction. So brands or businesses, a lot of the time, they may have their own um, KPIs internally that they're measuring. So that could be things like the level of social media engagement that they have or the number of sales leads that they're getting through in the wake of your event or during the time that they're promoting the event. Um, but from your side, you might actually need to start um, like measuring some key indicators at the very beginning before you've even started the um, sponsorship relationship. So um, I'm going to go back to that kind of example of like doing like artistic skill set workshops in an under-resourced community. And Michelle actually kind of mentioned this before with the, with the concept of like bringing music lessons and, and instruments to elderly people. So uh, you might need to do a survey at the start that says, what's the level just generally, like how many people do we know already have these artistic skills? Midway through, you might do another one um, that says, okay, are we starting to deliver this in the right way? Has there been a change from A to B? And how much of a change is it what we expected or is it less than we expected? You might wanna even tweak the way that you're doing the project as a result of that midpoint survey. So then at the end, you get the final understanding of where everything is sitting and um, you know then what your final impact is. And booking a debrief, this is something that uh, definitely I've like delivered massive projects and massive events where booking in a debrief for directly after the event, you're exhausted and you're like, I know we need to do this, but, and I just, it, I just couldn't advocate for it more because it's really the time when it's so fresh in your sponsor's mind. And it's probably the time you're going to get the most emotive testimonial and really get under the skin of like why they love what you do, why they see the value in it, how their staff, their customers responded to it. And it's probably when you're going to get the most rich responses um, in terms of understanding the value that you bring to the table. And maybe that's going to help you in terms of when you're going for a renewal conversation for your sponsorship. And then you really know like, what was the kind of immediate response that came after the event, or it could be useful for you when you're thinking about future um, events or projects that you're going to do. And then finally, and this is kind of more for the larger scale sponsorships rather than the smaller ones, but some companies may decide that they want to conduct a professional analysis. They may get an external agency to do um, an analysis of the sponsorship and the return on investment. And um, this is something to, to ask about up front if you are engaging in a bigger style of, of sponsorship relationship, because if you can, and you might not be able to get access to all of it, there might be commercially sensitive information in there. But if you can get an understanding of what the return on investment is as um uh, as analyzed by an external party, it can be so, so beneficial for you when you're looking at new corporate sponsorship relationships and knowing what to evaluate and what not to evaluate and what are the things that are um, important for both parties. So definitely keep that in mind. Um, okay, I'm going to pass over to Eileen now, who's going to chat a little bit about grant evaluation. Perfect. Thanks very much, Emily. And um, so just going to chat through briefly in terms of um, grant evaluations. Um, similarly, we're just going to touch upon our own experience in our management of these um, particular kind of grants. And um, so as I'm sure all of you are well aware, there are several types of grants that are available um, to kind of seek funding from. 
And these can include sources such as the public sector, uh, for instance, from the Arts Council or the Department of Tourism, Culture, Arts, Geltok, Sport and Media. They could be corporate funded, such as um, arts funds that we would manage here on behalf of Bank of Ireland and ESB. Or they could be a philanthropic grant, um, such as the ones that are available from Rethink Ireland and the Ireland funds. So in terms of grants, these can be open to any and all um, applications across all art forms, or they can be tied to one specific objective. Um, so, for instance, we are currently working with Bank of Ireland on the delivery of their arts fund and ESB on the management of their fund and these are really kind of targeting that support for artists and organizations with kind of clear goals bank of Ireland are very keen to try and support those projects that are really responding to the recovery now as we get out of um the current pandemic and esb are really trying to focus on their strategic mission of what does a brighter future look like and how can we engage the public in that kind of space some other funds might be more um, kind of focused on supporting projects such as um ones that are able to scale up or be replicated across the island or have maybe have a bit more of a focus on social issues and um, as you can see there it's very important to develop an artwork and project that responds directly to the objectives of the funds that you're applying to. So you should really try and take that time to kind of think about, you know, what the grant is or the funding opportunity is that is the correct fit for what you're trying to achieve in terms of your project or the artwork that you're trying to create. Fully investigate those specific objectives of the fund just to check if there's any kind of um, terms and conditions, any stipulations that you might have to try and think about right from the outset. And then really think about how your idea or your proposal, your project fits into those criteria so that you're, um, like we said before, you're really kind of starting to think about everything from the very outset before you even got into the kind of application phase. While all of these grants can be quite different, whether it's in terms of budget amounts, their timelines, what their specific objective is, one common question that will be asked in the application form is how are you going to measure the impact of your project or your artwork? So there is one, there is no one size all fits approach um, to evaluation um, and how to actually kind of measure your impact. It's very much dependent on the type of artwork or the project that you're working on, such as um, what Emily has mentioned in sponsorship and Michelle previously. It's very dependent on what you are specifically doing. It's very dependent on who you're planning to work with in terms of other artists in the creation of your work and maybe um, other participants to kind of drive the project forward or the audiences that you're trying to achieve at the end. Also, how you're planning to actually engage with people, whether it's a very direct kind of hands on process or if it's more kind of creating an artwork to then be enjoyed with people after the fact. And um, a lot of the evaluation methods that you're um, going to be thinking about, it's a lot of this will depend on your capacity to actually complete those processes. And um, as Emily has mentioned, if you're an individual artist, you should really kind of factor in appropriate time and budget whenever you're thinking about how long it might take you to complete an evaluation for your funder. Um, even if you're thinking about it might be quite simple methods, these all still take some time. And it's always better to kind of um, overthink about the amount of time that you need rather than under, um, under, under budget, just so that you make sure you have enough time um, allocated for that. If you're working within an arts organization, perhaps you might be able to dedicate a bit more time and resources to completing the evaluations and you're probably kind of doing these much more regularly. But whether you're an individual artist or an arts organization, it's very important to factor in some methods of evaluation from the outset when you're thinking about your actual application and kind of building in those elements of how to kind of gain that um, data and information from the outset. So we're just going to discuss now how to approach grant evaluation methods on the next slide. So as we can see there, it's very important to kind of think from the outset what you're trying to achieve with your artwork or your project um, in relation to this particular grant that you're applying for within that specific framework and um, just to make sure that you're hitting all of those boxes to make sure that it's a nice kind of um, cozy fit for you both whenever you're applying. Some of the objectives that you might be trying to achieve throughout your project or your artwork creation could be trying to maybe increase your audience reach. You could be trying to work with specific communities, whether that's people from a certain demographic background or in a certain location. You might be trying to um, promote positive engagement with public and general kind of members who live in the area. You might be trying to develop your own artistic practice. And you might have a whole range of other objectives that whether very important to you as an individual or the organization that you're applying on behalf of. The type of artwork or project that you're planning to create, develop, or um, kind of bring to fruition will mean very different approaches to evaluation. For instance, if you're planning to do something that's a bit more interactive, uh, which has got real-time engagement, such as maybe a performing arts production, that will require ongoing data capture throughout the um, delivery of the project. And as your audiences are coming in and are there in the moment um, at that kind of um, time. If you're creating a physical artwork, which is to be installed in a specific location, um, that's meant to be joined for um, kind of weeks, months, and hopefully years after, whether it's temporary or permanently installed, you're probably going to be looking toward capturing a lot of information 
after the installation of the artwork, um, as well as kind of capturing some information on the process throughout the creation of the artwork itself. Um, but in terms of your kind of public engagement piece, it's probably going to be geared more towards what happens after the fact of installation. When you're thinking about measuring impact, this can involve some quite simple steps, um, which are really all about showing the evidence of impact on those audiences who are coming out to experience your project or your artwork that's being installed, all of the artists involved, any participants um, who have been um, part of the process, and that, that can include um, some methods as we see there in terms of data capture. And this can really take a very simple form of ticket sales if you have that kind of option available to you, and um, tracking audience figures, any footfall to the area, maybe where your artwork has been installed, any numbers of people that you have participating, whether it's local community groups and um, local artists, and perhaps um, other kind of community areas that are involved with you. Um, audience feedback um, can either be conducted in the realms of online surveys or maybe a quick, simple poll. You know, would you recommend this production to um, a friend or a family member? Um, or what did you think about the artwork? Did you enjoy it? How did you feel or how did it make you feel? Um, social media feedback is always nice um, and very helpful. You can get online comments with any kind of um, communications that you put up online, any nice social interaction that you might have on your uh, media channels. And then just anecdotal evidence is always quite nice to kind of gather any testimonials from participants who maybe have engaged with you throughout the creation of your project or your work, um, any reviews that you might have received online, any kind of peer commentary, if that's applicable to you, maybe if you've actually created an artwork and it's been installed, if any of your peer members um, come back then with kind of feedback on that. All of this is very kind of valuable in information in terms of trying to measure that impact of your work. And we're just going to go through some examples of different approaches on the next slide. So for instance, we can just see here, so in terms of um, this kind of approach, so this is really focused on a project that is designed to have immediate engagement and impact, um, which is probably more along the lines of um, artworks and projects in the performing realm area. So for instance, an objective of your project might be that you have a performing arts project, which is really intending to engage with new audiences and trying to generate revenue. Some of the evaluation methods that you might be thinking of, including um, if you have time and capacity, would be to measure audience numbers, both in person and online, um, whether that's going to be uh, through your own kind of methods or if you're working with an organization that tracks box office systems. And um, you could try and survey audience members to encourage their own feedback and um, to help you with future events. You could examine the revenue streams, whether there's been any kind of a change or uptick, particularly in ticket sales, whether you maybe have hit your projected budget or your target, and then try and consider any area of growth for future presentations of this work, whether it be that you know, you've had a terrific run and everyone's telling you great feedback, would love to see it be extended or expanded or maybe um, put on elsewhere in a different location. The other example that we would have then is more around an artwork that's um, a physical presence. So um, this is really around having an installed artwork somewhere, whether it's temporarily or permanently installed. Um, some of the objectives of your project might be that you're going to work with other visual artists to try and create that artwork. Um, you're probably going to want to maybe encourage engagement from people and footfall from visitors to the artwork, whether it, wherever it's situated. And possibly you're also trying to develop your own artistic practice through this process. Um, some evaluation methods that you could use would be to survey the artists throughout the process and to kind of see where you've started off from in terms of that benchmark and where you've ended up and to try and help identify that expansion of their practice in terms of do they have maybe new skills that they've gained and um, have they now maybe got experience working in different media? Do they maybe have additional comfort in trying to convey their practice or their work to maybe external audiences if maybe they haven't been exposed to that kind of um, approach before? You can measure the footfall of the area um, where your artwork is installed kind of before and after the artwork has, has um, arrived and is now engaging with people. And then if possible, you could try and kind of survey visitors um, to gather that anecdotal evidence of how does the artwork make them feel? Um, are they happy that it's here? Would they like to know more information about it? Would they like to see further artworks um, established in the area? And then it's always a good idea to think about documenting the process for future use. As Michelle had said, some visual art um, artworks, it's better captured across video and that kind of um, content. So all of those kind of processes could be used for forming future communications about your artwork and um, very nice social media activity as well. You could pop nice bits up on your on your channels and um, that might be able to form the basis of a future art exhibition about this particular work. And it also can help you maybe to identify learnings for the next time and see what worked throughout this process, what maybe didn't and what could be maybe changed again and, and done better for the future. And um, within all of these examples, there is the potential to use both qualitative and quantitative methods of evaluation, as Michelle has outlined previously in the webinar. No matter what type of artwork or project that you're working on, um, you can use all these methods, but as Emily has stated as well, 
remember to be very specific to your own objectives and how you intend to measure the impact and your capacity to do so. Depending on your capacity as either an individual artist or within an arts organization, you should try and be realistic. Don't try and capture data that isn't gonna be possible to capture and just have that think from the very outset, how might you take some simple steps to capture that information? If you're planning to engage with audiences, how might you kind of measure that at certain points? If you're gonna work with participants, again, starting off from a benchmark at the beginning, where you're going to end up to and just kind of have a think about that from the outset and don't kind of overcommit to what you're going to be able to try and capture and feedback to your funder. You should also think about how you can use this data in the future. As Michelle mentioned before, this is really where you can make a very strong case for support. If you're able to demonstrate the, the success of your project to your current funder, you'll be able to use this information in all kinds of communications on social media or just general external communications about your work, your practice, the impact that you're having through um, all of your um, great kind of activity. And then all of this can kind of be built into your future funding applications. Um, I know myself, whenever I'm reading applications that have been submitted to any of the arts funds that we manage here at Business to Arts, it's really great to see how people have just started to think about those small, simple steps in which they're intending to gather that data to really demonstrate the impact of their project, which is always a great thing to be able to report back um, to corporate funders um, who work with us. And particularly, it's really interesting to see how people have been able to submit information from previous projects. I really just kind of, it highlights, you know, this is, I think, something that works. It's got um, very positive impact, really good engagement, and it's something that we would love to kind of see continue. It really immediately grabs your attention and builds a really strong case for support. Um, any questions that you might have in relation to um, grant application evaluations, just pop them in the Q&A box and um, we will be gathering all the questions throughout the webinar and we'll come back to it at the end. But Michelle is just going to touch briefly on commissioning from here on. Thanks, Eileen. Um, so when it comes to commissioning, a lot of what the team have um, already discussed will apply here. Um, but I think the thing with commissioning is a lot of the time evaluation, it's an integral part of the commissioning process. Um, so a lot of the times commissioners um, kind of they, they see it as, a, as an integral part of it. It's very important. Um, so that's really worth considering from the outset. And um, there might be budget um, for an expert evaluator that would some, a lot of the time that's best practice um, with, especially with public artworks, but there's not always funding for it. So that's really something to consider very much from the outset. Um, in terms of forms of evaluation for commissioning. So a lot of the quantitative and qualitative um, methods that we've already discussed would apply here, but I think um, a really interesting one, which probably for commissioning would be, would be peer fear feedback and um, would be something for you to definitely consider for commissioning. Um, and then also critical texts. So um, it might be a case that academics are invited to critically analyze um, the, the artwork um, in more specifically or to, to evaluate it in a more specific way in that context. Um, and then written reports of the process and the work. So this might be from the, the, the perspective of um, the commissioner, there might be an expert evaluator brought in, it might be um, yourself as the artist or the arts organisation that's involved, um, or there might be a team of people who'd be brought in um, in terms of that written report. And then images of the work and the work in progress, as Eileen was saying there previously, it's not just the end um, work um, to, to kind of to show pictures and, 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 and illustrate that, it's also the process of that work um, as it's coming to fruition. And then also copies of reviews and press releases and comment books and statements so it might be comments um, of visitors um, that's a very simple thing you might just have a comment book there um, and then in terms of sorry I'm just going to go back um, but increasingly we're actually seeing um, we're being approached by um, property development companies um, around commissioning artworks for um, residential developments and well this is something that they'll be doing their evaluation you know it's kind of an interesting example and um, for example if there's a sculpture in a residential development um, there might be a survey sent out to all residents and again they would there would be qualitative and quantitative aspects to that so they might be asked are you familiar with the artwork in the development? So a quantitative um, closed question might be yes or no as the answer. And then how often do you interact with the artwork? So quantitative again, it might be numerical twice a month. Um, and then how do you think the artwork fits in the development or how do you feel about the, the, the artwork and the development? Again, that might be qualitative. So around thoughts and feedback around what they think of that artwork. So we deal with quite a lot of commissioning in the visual art realm. However, commissioning obviously goes across all art forms and like music, dance, theater, and other art forms. Um, but I'm gonna move swiftly um, 
ahead because I'm just looking at the time in just terms of getting some questions um, in at the end. So in terms of kind of leveraging evaluation for future proposals and applications, and we've kind of talked about that before in terms of the case for support. So at Business to Arts, uh, we've been lucky enough to work with For Impact, which was founded by Tom Suds. So support For Impact, it's a social enterprise and it provides um, training and coaching for nonprofits all over the world. And their, their point of view for fundraising is that impact drives income. And really what that means is that people invest in people, people invest in stories. And if you can communicate and articulate um, and concisely present your impact and your story, then this will lead to investment in your project. And when you've gone through the, the evaluation process, you've collected your data, you've collected stories, you can really start to build that really strong case for support. And we've seen um, organizations really successfully um, do their own evaluation um, proactively every year, or sometimes maybe it's every three years, and they publish impact statements or impact reports um, to show their peers and their funders or other stakeholders what they're doing, but also how they're doing it and what impact their work has on their audience or um, for society or for you know, different, different types of stakeholders. But what does that look like? Well, this is an example, um, a really great example from London Irish Centre. You can see here, this is basically their impact um, a year in numbers. It's a really simple yet impactful depiction um, of the impact. And they probably measured um, some of these themselves, um, but I my guess would be that they probably had to evaluate um, probably for some of their funders as well. So some of these figures are probably, you know, drawing from different sources and probably giving to different funders as well. But some really interesting examples here, like 312 outreach visits to the most isolated, extremely impactful um, statement there. And then 5,434 nutritious meals served to clients. So, all of these are numerical, they've collected the data, they had their own evaluation processes, and this is what they were able to present um, at the end of the year. And here's another one. Um, this is from Fishamble. Fishamble worked with us um, on our fundraising fellowship. Um, and this is actually just at the end when they, they were finishing up with us or the, the year after they finished up with us on the fundraising fellowship, they created this really, really simple infographic, but it shows the, um, the impact that Fishamble have, have had, in have had in 2019. And what's interesting about Fishamble, it, it, it says what it it does what it says on the tin. It's Fishamble, the new play company. It says it in their title or in, in their name. However, they still have to, to show that they do what they do and what they say, they say who they are. And this is a really, really simple way. So they've set their aims to support the writers of new plays. And they've shown that they've supported 50% of writers of new plays on the island of Ireland were supported by, by Fishamble. And then they've collated their data. So 20, over 26,000 audience members reached. So they've probably collected, they've collected this from box office um, and different, different ways of um, measuring that. Then nine international tours, that's easy. Um, eight productions, another easy one. And 180 creative professionals employed. So they're really looking across not just their own core staff. But they're looking at different ways that they have given opportunities for creatives to be employed. So 180. So um, I suppose what we're seeing here is this really simple process of setting their aims, choosing their research methods, looking at existing data, coding and analyzing their data, developing their research tools, and then presenting their evidence in this very clear, concise way. Um, so this is something to think about, um, think about how you could potentially do that with different, um, with different measures and different evaluations. And there's some interesting and useful links there from Arts Council in the UK and for Impact, um, which did a case study around um, the land of storytelling. So that was for the Abbey Theatre. And then just moving on to, I suppose, top tips and um, to kind of to finish up before we go to Q&A and um, try to be objective uh, external evaluators. They're not always possible, but try and challenge your assumptions um, and use that kind of objective, objective point of view and bring other team members in um, to kind of look at what you're trying to evaluate and how you're trying to evaluate. And then look at, thinking about evaluation early. So if possible, build evaluation and start of the project. Consider what you're going to need um, the findings for. Evaluation, it doesn't just happen at the end. It's going to happen throughout the process, um, which Eileen and Emily both referred to earlier. Um, and you can learn and adjust and improve as you go. So that's not to say that it's impossible to evaluate after the fact. It does happen. Um, I know we certainly had to do it a few times because it was the only option, but it's always easier. It's always better. And sometimes it's actually cheaper if you plan that evaluation from the beginning. 
And then in terms of um, asking what you're trying to achieve. So evaluation, it's about measuring and understanding success and challenges. So the starting point has to be your, you know, your vision, like what, what's the point of it all? What will success look like? So from there, you can keep drilling down into something that you can measure. You know, what useful, actionable information will really shape what you do in the future. And if you can try and look beyond kind of merely recording what's happened and then look at kind of the process um, and, and kind of really consider like how you can apply the evaluation findings. You know, did you prove your, prove your hypothesis or how could you improve your practice? But there's always has to be space for unintended outcomes and feedback and experience that you might not have anticipated from your audience or from the participants. And then balance, you know, um, balance the ask of the evaluation with how the respondents have been involved. So it's fair to expect um, if participants are involved in a year long program and um, they might give you 45 minutes of their time for feedback. But if it's just one off event attendees, you know, the ask will probably have to be a lot less from them. And then finally, using mix, a mixture of methods, um, quantitative and qualitative, you know, as Eileen was saying, you don't have to use them all, use what's relevant. And um, the tools are going to be dependent on the project, the practice, the type, um, the timeline, um, as Emily was saying as well, if you can't get the survey back, the survey out and the feedback back in time, it's not going to work. What else could you do? Then it's also thinking about what can you piggyback some existing activity, what, what could you um, piggyback existing activities such as data collection? So do you have a survey going out already and could you actually just add on a few questions to that that might um, give you a few more insights? And then in terms of the don'ts, it's really about Keeping it simple, um, it could be a survey or carefully considered recording of the process that you've gone through. It um, doesn't have to be overcomplicated. It's really what works for you. Um, do what's in your own capacity. Um, and then also building it into your fee, which we talked about before. Um, if you need two hours to film something or you have to get a videographer in, ensure that that's budgeted for. Um, and then, as we kind of said, really um, evaluation can be really important for future applications and can really um, bolster um, the future applications that um, you're, you're going to be putting into different, different funders. Um, so a good example of evaluation from Business Schwartz is our case studies that we have for the Fundraising Fellowship Programme, which is funded by the Department of Tourism, Culture, Arts, Scale Talk, Sport and the Media. So we use both qualitative and quantitative evalu um, evaluation methods for these case studies. Um, for example, all fellows, um, they're sent out a survey, which they fill out. Um, it's providing data, numerical data on the funds that they've raised and other measurements. Um, all of the fellows are interviewed and they're asked both open and closed questions about their own experience. And then as well, um, also about the organization's journey. And then we um, analyze this data and we codify some of it and we also use it in aggregate form. Um, so these case studies, they're available, freely available on our website. If you um, have read of them and you have any questions, um, we definitely invite you to, to have a chat with us. Um, we're more than happy to kind of run through them in more detail if that's something that you're interested in. Um, and then finally, so there are a lot of resources out there. This is just a sample um, of some that might potentially be something that you could take a look at um, in, in your own time. Um, there are different models in terms of your project and presenting that and in figuring out you know, where along the way you want to do your evaluation and what are the inputs and the outcomes and the impact of your project. Um, there's the logic model, which is kind of like a roadmap. There's theory of change model. There's social return on investment methodology. Uh, we've used the theory of change model um, for our new stream program which has kind of come to fruition with our fundraising fellowship program and um, so the, there's lots there i would definitely recommend taking a look at them um, the, even if you google and look at the images that can sometimes give you enough of an idea if it's something that that for you would work and um, the arts council of england have a really interesting uh, website which is specifically around uh, evaluation called impact and insight and then there are other tools like on Culture Hive around measuring return on investment. Um, creative placemaking evaluation was much more specifically around kind of artworks um, in the public realm, which might be interesting. And then also other toolkits, um, which um, are toolkits and templates on wewillthrive.uk. So I'm going to stop talking now. Um, and if anyone has any questions, I think there are a few popped up. Um, yeah, um, I might actually, the first one I'm just going to um, actually pitch to Eileen. So, um, thinking back on commissions because i know eileen works a lot in, in public art commissions finding that expert evaluator for a commission how does that typically work and um, so it can take form in a couple of different ways and um, possibly if you're working with someone who has experience in this and the commissioner might already know someone that they want to maybe kind of um, bring into the process and that might be someone that they've decided that they want to work with them 
and from the outset the building an evaluation kind of program with that person they've identified and um, it could be someone who works in public art creation with its public art officer and um, it could be other people who does a lot of experience with kind of building and creating and kind of figuring out how public art actually sits within that kind of realm of place making so normally from a commissioner kind of perspective whenever Michelle mentions about having an expert evaluator it's about having someone whether it's yourself working in a partnership with someone um, or perhaps the commissioner has already kind of identified a person that they would like you to work with and it's about kind of working together on those kind of you know methods and, and information to try and gather together and um, but typically there would be someone that might be kind of identified from the outset or we could look towards the public art officers who have a wealth of information and experience in creating public art for the realm. Um. And sorry, there's also uh, just one here asking if, if you're looking at um, things like grant applications, what are some of the criteria, particularly like for, for evaluation, that might be something that would rule you out then that, that, wouldn't, that would mean you don't go through to the next round? Um, so occasionally, whenever you're looking at a grant application, it might be asking you, how are you going to measure that impact? And um, it can be a very simple question in terms of their response. But if you don't maybe kind of just list a few steps about what you're planning to do, so you will already have outlined your objective as to what you're trying to achieve, whether it is that theatre production that you want to maybe hold outdoors now in terms of maybe a COVID response or the adaptation that we've had to go through now. But if you can just outline very briefly audience surveys, I want to capture ticket sales or online streaming audiences. And um, if you don't kind of say that you will do any kind of an evaluation or maybe if, if you try and say that you're not sure how, but you will do something, it's always a good idea just to put in a couple of very brief bullet points as to what you're going to try and achieve. And that might even get kind of buy you some time. But if you if you don't maybe have an answer to that that specifically outlines some steps and um, to show how you're going to maybe try and measure that impact, um, it probably will be... Um, less likely to rise up to the top of the pile in comparison to other projects that might be able to come forward with that um, experience of, I'm going to, yeah, capture bumps on seats, people in front of a laptop, um, how the ticket sales are going, social engagement online, things like that. So always try and make sure that you put something into that kind of answer box. Yeah, I think as well, definitely, like I know we've mentioned it a few times, but that this whole like thinking about it from the very beginning and not leaving it to midway, I've definitely seen some applications where people have said, by midway through the project, we will know what evaluation techniques will be to use. And unfortunately that it, it just requires that, that bit of extra pre-thinking to make sure that it's um, kind of set up and ready to go when you get to the point that somebody's ready to, to, to give you the grant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. It, it is that thing of, yeah, as much as possible, whenever you've kind of completed your application form for the grant, everything is there. It, it's a fully kind of created and developed project um, and you can get a hit the ground running as soon as you receive funding. Um, because like we all know, you know, time can disappear and things can run away from you and then suddenly you're several months into a project and then you realize that you can't benchmark something because you haven't got data from a few months prior so it is about having that full holistic approach to the grant application from the very outset with all of the necessary tools to kind of get from a to z and all of the different steps in between michelle there's one for you here um i played a previous slide if you want to I think it's the fish amble slide. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, so I can go through it with you again. And these slides, everything will be up. Um, so I might, I'll go back to that slide if this person wants to have a look at it and go through them quickly. So yeah, so setting aims and objectives, your research method, review existing data, code and analyze data, develop your research tools, and presenting your evidence. So there it's, it's really kind of going through those steps um, as a, as a process that could be as simple as that um, for you to just, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of, we've kind of repeated the same thing again, you know, a few times in different ways today. And I think that that's really kind of a quite clear um, way that you could just potentially use that as your kind of your starting point um, and really like kind of looking at the scope of the program, responses to, pro to the program, audience levels, employment created, like Fish Amble have used very specific ones that work for them. Um, and it'd be the same, you know, if you're an artist working on your own or in a group, you know, in a group of artists or whether you're a larger arts organization, you're going to have different measures. Um, and I think Fish Amble and London Irish Centre, they both have completely different, both completely different measures um, and they're all really impactful. So you just have to kind of try and find your own. Um, and there's only one, two, three, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's seven indicators there. So it's, it's you know, not too many and um, it's definitely manageable absolutely um 
Okay, if there's, <laughs> yeah, if there's no other questions, then I think we will probably wrap up and let people finally go and enjoy their lunch, hopefully. Um, thank you so much to everybody that's tuned in. Um, Michelle, do you have any comments? I know that obviously your, your email address is there for people if they want to get in touch. Yeah, just if anyone has any questions or they'd like to talk to us more about the Arts Affiliate Programme and how you might be able to avail of the benefits of that, please give us a shout. Or if you have any questions about anything today, you can email me at michelle, michelle at business2arts.ie and um, the YouTube uh, uh, link will be there so you can look watch back. Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.